bum 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 And we're applying Dr. Don Hubner's The Sibling Survival Guide, Surefire Ways to Solve Conflicts, Reduce Rivalry, and Have More Fun with Your Brothers and Sisters to Their Relationship Woes. Ho, 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 ho. It's December, friends. It's my birthday month. The 27th, Lisa's birthday. It's also officially the fifth year of Comic Book Couples Counseling. Our anniversary was on the first. That's right. So, like, we've been doing Comic Book Couples Counseling longer than high school. So I feel like we have like graduated mm. from being mere students to like now, if we were saved by the bell, we would be getting ready for the college years. Oh, okay. All right. But we haven't had a graduation yet. I feel like the big celebration has to come with the fifth year anniversary. Like yeah. I feel like next year, December 1st, we should do some kind of event. We should do like Ooh. a live recording or something. I love that idea. If there were people who were actually interested in coming to the live recording besides your parents and my parents. I mean, that's a party right there. All right. <laughs> I feel like we could get a few more folks plus our parents, and that's enough to justify a live recording. Yeah, maybe some of our patrons. I wonder what couple that would be. Like, oh. part of me feels like we need to revisit Scott Summers and Jean Grey because they were our first couple. But maybe we should actually do a couple that people have been clamoring for recently, which is Scamma? Scott Summers and Emma Frost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's I, some team schema out there. Yeah, I think maybe if we did some kind of like side-by-side -side comparison yeah. and have like the decisive comic book couples counseling, which partner is actually better for Scott yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah, so if you're one of like the three people willing to come out to Virginia for a live recording or you're already nearby, or if you're already nearby, let us know if you like that idea and we will start planning because we should probably start planning now if we're going to do a live podcast recording. Yeah, we, we need a venue that holds at least 12 people. Yeah, at least 12 people. Uh, but I love December. I love the holiday season. I love the movie marathons that we always do. You know, we have to watch Die Hard. Mm -hmm. We have to watch Gremlins. Scrooged. Scrooge, you got to do Scrooge. Mm -hmm. We actually kicked things off last night by going out to the Alamo Draft House in Ashburn to see Violent Night, the killer Santa movie starring David Harbour. If you are at all resistant to the Christmas spirit, let me highly recommend going out to see Violent Night as your transitional film. Because I myself have a hard time, like as much as I love the Christmas spirit, I yeah. love getting festive and putting on a sweater and watching a heartwarming film. Like there is still part of me that um, cringes at the idea of kicking off the Christmas season and getting that shopping going. And You always resist those transitional periods. Like mm -hmm. when we leave Halloween and we go into Thanksgiving and then we go into Thanksgiving into December, uh, you hesitate. You don't want to dive in, but eventually you go buck wild because you are very much a person who loves putting up a tree and drinking some eggnog. And singing Christmas carols. Yes. Yeah, well, that's what makes Violent Night so good because cinematically, it blurs the edges mm. between Halloween season, the awkwardness of Thanksgiving, going into Christmas. Let's celebrate 
generosity and kindness and selflessness. Watching Violent Night reminded me of the experience of reading a Daniel Warren Johnson comic mm. where you go into Murder Falcon or do a power bomb and you're like, this is metal as hell. Yeah, kick ass. This is so gnarly and violent. But somewhere along the line of that narrative, uh, Daniel Warren Johnson pulls you by the heartstrings and has you crying by the end. Yes. Violent Night does that. I, like... When at, when you get to the obligatory scene in a Christmas movie where the parents discover that like believing in Santa is actually the more wholesome thing to do. I like I always get super choked up and Violet Knight spoilers delivers yeah, yeah. on the Christmas spirit on the um like reuniting of a family and putting differences aside so that you can express some gratitude for, you know, everybody's mutual existence. It does what Die Hard does, mm -hmm. what Gremlins does. You know, Christmas is not just the backdrop to those stories. Family is essential to both of those films. The coming together of humanity to uh, defend an evil terrorist organization. Well, you know... Like, Die Hard's a little trickier to say it's a Christmas film. I know there's a lot of, like, controversy around that, but I do fall into the camp that it is a Christmas film mm -hmm. because it is about reuniting the family and recognizing what you have, yeah. not what you don't have. So I say Die Hard's a Christmas film. Violent Night is certainly a Christmas film with even more Christmas drapings on it. Um, but it's also, like, you know, it's crazy gory. It's way gorier than Die Hard or Gremlins. I would say that it is more of a transitional film than Die Hard is mm. because... Violent Night has the splashy, gory dread uh -huh. of a horror film. Uh -huh. It has the family tension of Thanksgiving uh -huh. and then delivers on that Christmas spirit, um, blessed are those who don't see Santa and still believe kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So then what comes after Violent Night? If we're, it, like, if the end game is a Christmas story or, I don't know. The end game is always a Muppet's Christmas Carol. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, agreed, agreed. So if the end game is a Muppet's Christmas Carol and the beginning is Violent Night, what comes next? Where do we go after this one? Well, maybe Home Alone? I think, like, Home Alone is a little bit down the road. I feel like... Lethal Weapon would be something you, uh, you would watch next. Yeah, I think you're right. So it would go Violent, Violent Night, Night, Lethal, Lethal Weapon. Weapon, Home Alone, Die Hard. We need another, like, more Christmassy or Christmas. Well, Gremlins. Like, Gremlins has okay. got to be in there. Like, Love, uh, love Actually. Yeah, Love Actually. I know Actually, Love Actually is a problematic movie. But, but we love it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can't let it go. We can't let it go just yet. So I would say Violent Night, Lethal Weapon... Home Alone, Gremlins, Love Actually, Scrooge, Muppets. Uh, do we need one more I before like, the Christmas Carol? Well, we, you know, we have a we have many days before a Christmas Carol. Oh, so do we need like do we need twenty five? <laughs> We're not going to go through twenty five. Yeah, but I think we have like the arc. I think you watch Scrooge before a Christmas Carol, but you need something between Scrooge and Muppets Christmas Carol because you can't have two Dickens adaptations back to back. A Christmas Story. Yeah, Christmas Story. There yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We Perfect. did it. Oh, Christmas Vacation. Oh! Mm. That Christmas would... Vacation after a Christmas Story, then capping everything off with Christmas Carol, Muppets Christmas Carol. I would flip those two. You I would those do. Two. I would do Christmas Vacation before a Christmas Story. Yeah, 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 because, because the purest forms are a Christmas Story and Muppets Christmas Carol. There you go. I think we did it. We have a plan. Now, we didn't even talk about Christmas comics. Oh, that's probably, sh that should have been our <laughs> intro. <laughs> but, like, I think a great Christmas comic to read this time of year is the Mirage Studios, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, Michelangelo micro series issue Ooh. that came after, I think it came after, it definitely came after the Raphael one. Yeah, it goes Raphael micro series, Leonardo micro series, and then Michelangelo. And then the Donatello one is where Donatello meets up with Jack Kirby, which also has like a little bit of a Christmas vibe to it. But that Michelangelo issue, if you're looking for a Christmas comic, read that comic. I feel like any Ninja Turtles comic or film could be gingerbread housed under the category of Christmas film totally. because they all have the themes 
of fraternity, family, and I think that they have a healthy respect for good cheer as well. Which is probably why every cartoon series, every season has a Christmas episode. And in 1994, there was that direct-to-video Christmas special, We Wish You a Turtle Christmas. That is on YouTube. I'll try to include a link in the show notes. That's worth watching, Ooh. even though it's kind of nightmarish and awful, but in a beautiful giving way. We could definitely fold it into our Christmas transitional films, probably somewhere after Gremlins. <laughs> yeah, after Gremlins. But before a Christmas story, mm, right? Yes. You know, it would actually weigh in quite well regarding our spectrum of transitional Christmas films would be Michelangelo. Oh, yeah. He's the party dude. He's the pop culture guy. He would have an opinion on this. Absolutely. And he is in our waiting room right now. Yes, because we're actually here to discuss the relationship dynamics of the four Turtle Brothers as experienced in the Archie comics. If you have somehow stumbled into this episode as your first comic book couples counseling episode, please stop. Go to the show notes. Our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles conversation actually began with the 1990 movie featuring special guest star Brian Young of the B&B show fame. That's right. Right? Uh, and then our second episode on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was our conversation centered around the Mirage Studios comics, the first seven issues. And this is our third episode on the Turtles and it is the episode that I have been looking forward to the most because the Archie Comics era may be the weirdest era of Turtle Comics. The weirdness starting for me with what is this comic even called? Because the cover says, not Teenage Mutant Ninja right. Turtles, <laughs> but Cyber Samurai Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures, which but is, then it also says Part One of Five. Yeah, but this is also issue number sixty-two of Archie yeah. Adventure series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the whole series is called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures, and this is issue sixty-two. Mm -hmm. But because it's jumping ahead in time, and actually the brothers we're going to be talking about are not the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle brothers; these are the twenty-something Ninja Turtle brothers. I would say that they're like late 20s because they all have now established careers. They have taken separate residences. Yes. They have a, not like a secret layer, but like an office building called Turtle Co. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got a lot going on. Uh, but it is technically Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures, and the first issue is 62, and we're going to be talking 62 through 66. And this is part one of five of Dreamland. Yes. As well as part one of five of Cyber Samurai. I think we don't have to worry about the part one of five Cyber Samurai. I think they are confused. Okay. <laughs> so there's the cover rebrand, uh -huh. and then the official narrative story is Dreamland. So this is part one of five of Dreamland. And... We're not even talking about the weird backup story involving April O'Neil rescuing an honest-to-goodness angel. Using her ninja skills. Which is set in the year 1999. We should use th this sub-series as our New Year's special because it is Y2K related. It is Y2K related, but there's not really a lot there to base a whole episode on, Lisa. Certainly not a session, but it is worth reading, if for no other reason, the Grey Morrow art, which is incredible. But what is the deal with these Archie comics and why Why are they so wild? <laughs> well, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures books, they ran from 1988 to 1995. The earliest issues were direct adaptations of specific Ninja Turtle cartoon episodes. I think the first five issues were that. But eventually, they branched out into their own weird, weird stories. After that fifth issue, the series was handed over to Ryan Brown and Stephen Murphy, although Murphy would work under the pen name Dean Clarion for all of his Ninja Turtle Adventures comics. Weird. Well, like, was he, like, ashamed? Uh, you know, I don't know. I couldn't find any information why he was using a pen name, but I, too, am fascinated by that. Yeah. 
In my head canon, it's a Stephen King, Richard Bachman thing. Like when he wants to write a certain story, he uses the Dean Clarion brand. Mm -hmm. He gets into the mindset of Dean to tell Ninja Turtle adventure (laughs) stories. I do see that you would have to be in a certain state of mind to produce such a tale. Brown and Murphy were Mirage Studios creators working under Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. Brown is even responsible for designing many of the early Ninja Turtles toys for Playmates, and he was deeply concerned with environmental issues and found ways to incorporate those anxieties into those toys and into this book. Yeah, like the cover even has like the Statue of Liberty like immersed in the water, clearly. There's been an apocalypse in the future, right? Yeah, yeah. The, The day after tomorrow has happened, they are living in it. So while Archie was on the cover, the books really do feel like Mirage Studios stories skewed slightly to a younger audience more familiar with the cartoons. Mm. They could do things in these books that the cartoon series would never allow. For example, the Shredder slowly revealed an honorable side. He was no longer the two-dimensional villain, and this aspect would continue in other iterations of Ninja Turtle comics. Also, we've already said this, but April O'Neil, she got busy. She picked up the katana and started training in the ways of ninjutsu. When you pick up these later issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures, like we're doing for this week's episode, you'll notice that the stories are nearly as gnarly as the original Mirage Studios comics. This became a concern for Archie. The moment the series dipped just a little bit in sales, it got the axe. I never read these comics growing up. I thought they were just too kiddy and full of nonsense. But, and that's actually still true. Yeah. It's true. (laughs) They are kiddy and full of nonsense. But I've been devouring these books over the last couple of months, and I am in freaking love with them. There are trade paperback collections out there, but they're all out of print. However, you can get them digitally. And if you have a Comixology Unlimited subscription, you can get them free with that. So hopefully you listening have gotten a chance to read them because these comics do need to be read to be believed. Our focus is on the Dreamland storyline, which is covering the four brothers as 20-somethings. And yes, they do beat the snot out of some Nazis and there is time travel and it is glorious. But before we can get these turtles into session and figure out their unique sibling dynamics, We got to look at our love expert, Lisa, who's helping us out with Leo, Mikey, Raph, and Don this week. Yes, our love expert for our favorite fraternal foursome, as well as Splinter, is Dr. Don Hubner from her book, The Sibling Survival Guide, Surefire Ways to Solve Conflicts, Reduce Rivalry, and Have More Fun with Your Brothers and Sisters. I cannot resist saying the full title. The longest title. (laughs) Illustrated by Cara McHale. Last session, we covered the introduction a note to parents and caregivers, and the first two chapters. And I think we've come away with some pretty accessible strategies for building better sibling relationships. I don't know that we're going to be using the material from the introduction since the father figure Splinter is absent in this arc. Yeah, he's gone. Yeah, I think- He's gone, gone. I think he's transcended the mortal rat race and is one with the universe at this point. But I would like to put the main takeaways from the first two chapters in the forefront of our minds. One, there's no such thing as a sibling without the bad parts. (laughs) Apply that to all humans. That's right, all relationships. And two, trade your sibling stink glasses for your no big deal frames. Hard to do. I've been working on it this week. It is possible. I love how Dr. H boils down these big psychological concepts down to something that even a child can understand and work with. My main reservation with the Sibling Survival Guide is that Dr. Hubner has this ongoing simile that having a sibling is like having a dog. (laughs) If you want the joy of having a dog, you also have to pick up the poop. (laughs) We're not experts, obviously, which is why we defer to Dr. Hubner's expertise. But isn't likening your sibling to a dog a little bit dehumanizing? To me, it just like plays into a child's myopic worldview. I think that's the point. You have to play into a child's myopic worldview. Yeah, and I guess like we're trying to influence behavior and the the kid like maturing into like a full grown empathetic adult is like step number two or something. I have to set that reservation aside though, because the next three chapters really triple down on the idea of having a sibling is like having a dog. Dr. H 
ended chapter one by saying that we, the reader, speaking to a child's sibling, have the power to change our sibling's behavior by changing our behavior. In chapters three through five, she outlines learning theory, saying that changing your sibling's behavior is like training a dog. You give them treats for the behaviors that you like and ignore the behaviors that you want them to quit. In chapter three, Reward the Good Stuff, Dr. Hubner explains that when we're feeling antagonized, it's better to respond to our siblings than to react. Reacting is riding the wave of negative emotion and doing or saying the first thing that pops into our head. Responding is distancing yourself from the negative emotion so that you can consider the right thing to do and say. In learning theory, rule number one is to reward good behaviors. For each of their brothers, the turtles should have a list of rewards in their back pocket so that they can reinforce good behaviors. It's all pizza. Yeah, that like that is like uh, obviously the very first one. <laughs> but it can be more subtle for that. So, for example, when Raphael doesn't balk at getting orders from Leonardo, give him some alone time. Better yet, let him choose his role mm. in the next mission. Or another one. Donatello takes time out of his hyper-focused solitary activity to watch a movie with Mikey. Give him some of your undivided attention so he can drone on about his latest tech obsession uninterrupted. <laughs> but again, pizza. Or pizza. In chapter four, entitled Don't Take the Bait, Dr. H gets into rule number two of learning theory, which is ignore bad behaviors. There are two downsides to reacting rather than responding. Reacting is often the behavior that gets you in trouble with Splinter and leaves you feeling guilty. And it doesn't actually get your sibling's behavior to change. When your sibling is being annoying, they actually want to get a rise out of you. So by reacting instead of responding, you're actually reinforcing the behavior you don't like. To illustrate this concept, I'd like to revisit an incident from last session when we were discussing the one issue micro series in which Raph meets Casey Jones. It was so good. I love that issue. Me too. But do you remember the inciting incident, that sparring match at the beginning with Raph and Mikey? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, they were just fighting, right? They mm -hmm. were just training. And does Raph accuse Mikey of cheating or is it Mikey who ch accuses Raph of cheating? The reason I ask is because when I pulled this as an example of someone reacting rather than responding, I was holding Raphael more responsible. And I feel like the issue does too, where Raphael's temper gets out of hand and because of that, he gets kicked out, and that's when he meets Casey Jones. Right. But now, like, revisiting it through the eyes of, like, reacting rather than responding, I feel like Mikey is a little bit more responsible than we gave him credit for. Like, he kind of gets off scot-free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's important that Raph does remove himself from the situation, right? Because he's at 10 you know, you got to get out of the room when you're at 10. You got to go and brood on your own. Of course, maybe I'm also projecting how I handle all tense situations. I would argue that kicking Raph out of the lair so he can have a have alone time is actually rewarding his bad behavior. They do kick him out, right? He doesn't actually remove himself. They throw him out. Yeah, Leonardo throws him out, but I, I kind of think that that's what he wants. He wants to see himself as separate. Yeah, but that is yeah. even that's what Brad wants also. <laughs> but but th I think that's even beside the point because what I want to illustrate is this concept of don't take the bait when your sibling is goading you into some kind of conflict. So the issue actually starts with... Raphael falling fantastically onto a pile of furniture and Mikey laughing at him. Right. And that makes Raph angry. Yeah. And so he ratchets up the intensity of the match because he doesn't like being laughed at. And he's also dealing with the stress of Splinter missing. And then Mikey reacts instead of responds by trying to teach Raphael a lesson and evading the strikes and then giving him this big crack to the head. And then Raph responds with this really painful uppercut and Mikey finishes the fight while giving Raph this lecture about his cockiness and how pride goeth before the fall, which leads to Raph throwing a tantrum and grabbing a wrench. By reacting rather than responding and taking each other's bait, both brothers participated in spinning out this enjoyable ninjutsu exercise into something that was out of control and dangerous. Imagine if Mikey had never made the joke in the first place, 
dangling this bait to incite Raph's temper, or if Raph chose to ignore Mikey's joke and to continue sparring with a level head, this whole incident could have gone way differently. I don't know. That's how dogs behave, Lisa. <laughs> I I feel like, um, like Leonardo, in that episode, we blamed Raph. Yeah, we that's true. We held him entirely responsible for that conflict. And with this, like, don't take the bait mentality, it makes both siblings culpable. Even if... Like, Raph did take it to this completely other level with the wrench. Well, we have bought into the narrative of Raph is the bad boy. Mm -hmm. So in situations like that, we then go like, well, he's the bad boy brother. And we kind of treat him like the bad boy brother. And that's not fair. It, it's right? not fair. And that happens in families all the time. Like every sibling, and this is me speaking not from my own experience <laughs> as an only child, but as a person married to uh, a, a person with many siblings, th when a sibling has a role, if they venture out of that role, sometimes we don't like that. I can actually use a real life example. Okay. So like, okay. as our listeners know, I'm third of four. And a lot of conflicts between me and my older siblings was I just wanted someone to hang out and play with me, but they were three and four years older than right. me, which is a huge difference And um, when you're younger. And so I remember specifically I would do this thing where Joe would be in his room and I would sit against his door and just go like, play with me, play <laughs> with me. And I would knock on the door, play with me, play with me. And um, at, at one of these incidents, um, Joe was holding a Windex bottle and he sprayed me in the face Ooh. with a Windex bottle, which like, but I was there dangling this bait in front of him for him to get upset. So I'm not saying that I definitely, like nothing bad happened. And that, like the reason that that is where my mind goes is because it was like so outside of his usual behavior. It wasn't like a, a behavior that I anticipated, but I did anticipate him getting upset with me Yeah, yeah. because I was just pestering. And it wasn't outside the behavior of little Lisa. Yeah, no, I was being the worst. <laughs> in chapter five, Dr. H gives us two more strategies to deal with siblings inciting behaviors, which he calls ignoring with a twist, either distracting your sibling or just agreeing with them. One way of distracting your siblings from their bad behaviors is with a joke. What if when Mikey laughed at Raphael, ha ha ha, good fall Raph, Raphael responded with, oh yeah, I'm a regular Buster Keaton. <laughs> Mikey would have appreciated that classic cinema reference. He would have. <laughs> or when Mikey noticed that Raph was getting hot headed, suggested a change of activities. Man, this match is getting too hot for me. Pizza break? <laughs> The agreeing with them strategy, I think, would have been pretty disarming as well. What if, instead of lecturing Raph about his cockiness, Mikey just relented and said, you're a really effective fighter, Raph. We're lucky to have you on the team. A few words of affirmation go a long way between siblings. Yeah, and I love all of that. And I think those are great tools. I think they are also very difficult for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to deal with them but maybe not the Samurai Cyber Mutant Ninja Turtles. A little bit older, I think they can use those tools quite effectively. And they are also not like all in, like just crowd in, in April O'Neil's apartment. They, yeah. ha they have a little space, a little more autonomy. And they've moved beyond the hormone explosion too. Uh, but before we can get into those relationship dynamics of the Cyber Samurai Ninja Turtles, we got to get into some words of affirmation. No, no, no. So for first time listeners, Lisa, should we explain what the words of affirmation are? The words of affirmation are our way of giving back to our new and upgrading Patreon subscribers. We curate and use words of affirmation ourselves, and we're more than happy to pass them on to you. These were collected straight from Splinter's Mouth from the 1987 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon series. I'm very excited to unleash these pearls of wisdom to our listeners today. Yeah. I thought that these were delightful. Way to go collecting them. Thank you. So while these words of affirmation are dedicated to these three specific patrons, everyone can partake in them. Yeah. Write them down. Put them up on your bathroom mirror. Use them. Think about them. Meditate on them. And with that, let's get into a more quiet, calm mindset. Let's get ready to respond rather than react. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> we're ready to begin. Natural deep breath. Mm, we're not forcing anything. Anthony Saitko. 
you understand that there is no monster more dangerous than a lack of compassion. Stephen W. You know that anger clouds the mind. Turned inward, it is an unconquerable enemy. Robert Germany. You realize that sometimes it is best to sit still. Running into battle without knowledge or preparation is foolish. Mm, yeah. That's nice. Splinter. I love him. And we actually have a web page of all the best Yeah, Splinter I did not collect these. <laughs> affirmation quotes. And I love that. I love that you can turn to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Splinter and he will hook you up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess we should probably, for integrity's sake, put the link in our show notes. You'll have to send me that link. I will. I have. Then, I have. I've already done it. Okay. Good. Thanks again to Anthony, Stephen, and Robert for joining up with our Patreon series. Of course, we realize that not everyone can afford to support us financially, and that is a okay. You can also go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, write us a five star review. We will read it here on the podcast. We would seriously appreciate that. Thank you to everyone who's already done that. Also. You could just Twitter us or Hive us. I don't know if Hive is still a thing. Hive it's had a rough, like, rough week. <laughs> the servers are down with Hive, but I hope those three employees can get it back up and running soon. But just follow us and just throw us some words of affirmation. It really just keeps us going. It really does. Thank you, everybody. But seriously, you should join our Patreon now because we're about to launch a new series and it's going to have some incredible guest stars. Yeah. And we've already talked to Daniel Warren Johnson about joining it for that. You so, shouldn't spoil uh, that. Uh, You're sharing uh, too much. No. Oh, OK. I'm going to shut it down. Shut it down. Daniel Warren Johnson is going to be in our Patreon feed soon. OK, we have to get into this comic. I know that turtles live a long time, but we're not <laughs> going to be on this mortal coil oh. forever. So let's just get into it. Oh, don't jinx us. Uh, Bossa Nova, baby. This week, we're reading Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures issues 62 through 66, published by Archie Comics between November 1994 and March 1995. These comics were written by Stephen Murphy and Chris Allen, penciled by Chris Allen and Gray Morrow, inked by Brian Thomas and John Dio. How do you say that last name? John D'Agostino. D'Agostino. Colored by Barry Grossman and lettered by Gary Fields. Here's the plot synopsis taken straight from Goodreads. The all-ages action continues in dreamland. In the future, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have become the Cyber Samurai Mutant Ninja Turtles. The brothers have new powers and new allies, and they're going to need them to face some new enemies in this time-hopping story from the world of tomorrow. What do you think about that plot synopsis, Lisa? I have some quibbles. <laughs> um, one, they don't have new powers. Uh, you know, they got new suits. They, they got do. got those cyber samurai And suits. so they can zip around. Thanks, yeah. Donatello. Yeah. Um, also, like, I know this is the all ages series, <laughs> but I do think that, like, this is a little bit more adult, especially when it comes to their relationship concerns. Sure. Like, Raphael, he's really, like, settled down. Yeah. He has Mezcal. Yeah. And I don't know if you need a warning about that. I don't but... think you need a warning, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> that it's, like, I don't know. I, I don't find this to be kitty at all. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> there should be a Hitler warning. Yeah, right? like, yeah. Or a scary, scary zombies <laughs> melting face warning. There's so much violence in or, this comic. Or blatant religion with the angels warning. Yeah, like I would love to see what would happen if this comic landed in a 2022 parents' hands. Uh, I think some minds would get melted and some letters would be written to Archie. But damn it, in the 90s, it was a free-for-all and this was a kid's comic. And they did get flack. They oh. did get letters. There's one issue where they actually depict Muhammad. Oh, <laughs> no. And they were flooded with concerned individuals. What is it? Charlie he Hebdo? Yeah, Charlie Hebdo. Yeah. yeah. So before Charlie Hebdo, there was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures. There was an issue where they travel to Jerusalem. Okay. And when they get to Jerusalem, they sneak in through some luggage and someone opens the luggage and they pounce out and they go, Cowabunga, Jerusalem. Because <laughs> what else would you say? And, 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 oh, oh, and in that issue, there's like a, a riot, right? Uh -huh. And they get into the middle of this riot and someone throws a Molotov cocktail and 
Raphael catches the Molotov cocktail and he doesn't know what to do with the cocktail, so he throws it inside a car and he explodes a car. Oh man! And look at me. I'm going. I'm like. I don't know if this is a kiddie comic. I don't know if they'll find the concerns of middle-aged Raphael <laughs> relatable. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures, like I said, was the brainchild of Dean Clarion, you mm -hmm. know, Stephen Murphy and Ryan Brown. And they were, you know, they were like Neil Adams and Denny O'Neill with Green Lantern, Green Arrow. They were trying real hard to be progressive. And in doing so, they step in it over and over again. But... Also, I appreciate the attempt yeah. to tackle these issues and talk about, you know, uh, the greenhouse effect. There as you go. We see with this volume, the reason why the future is flooded is because we were terrible to our planet and the polar ice caps melted and flooded all of the cities. Well, it's 2023 now and we are like quickly approaching 2094 and we are well on our way to having our cities flooded so prescient yeah okay 2094 wait what that's where this future is 2094 so, what so I... are they in their 20s they're, they, they're <laughs> not in their 20s right how old are these turtles like so what i presumed is that they t use the time because I ha I haven't read any issues before this, right. so I'm just writing my own canon. Okay. And I presume that did they just go through the time slip machine and then it broke down and they just got stuck? I don't think so. Oh, so my understanding is that this is the future that they have lived into. Mm -hmm. They haven't jumped ahead in time. These are our turtles. So if our turtles came out in 1984, and now it's 2094, 110 years in the future, this is 110 years in the lifespan of the turtles. Because when we first meet the future turtles a couple trade paperbacks ago in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures, no time is mentioned. It just says the future. As far as I can tell, this is the first time that they've actually given a date, 2094. And while they have been going back in time using the time slip machine, they have not been going forward in time. Okay. So these are some real old ass turtles. That makes sense though, because like, I know that like Galapagos tor tortoises or whatever live a really long time. Turtles do live a long time. Rats don't. Yeah. Splinter has died of old age. We are told that. And rats live like three to six years <laughs> top. So Splinter had a good run. So if he lived, if he lived to be like 40, mm -hmm. that's like, I'm not going to do the math. That's like five times or six times the amount of his regular lifespan. So they're going to be like regular Edward Cullens yeah. living hundreds yeah. and hundreds yeah. of years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've done a lot with that time. Yeah, like married Mezcal, who now seems really inappropriately young. <laughs> Granted, if they're married, she's like of age. It's like live your life. Well, what you learn a couple trade paperbacks ago, when the Turtles from the Future go back in time to meet our Turtles, they built this empire, Turtle Co., through Donatello's technology. Mm -hmm. So when the ice caps melted and the cities flooded, the rat population exploded. Not Splinter, though. He just died. <laughs> <laughs> the rat population explodes. Rat King, hmm, that's interesting. Rat King's still around. What the hell year is this? Maybe like, is it is it the Rat King from the Nutcracker no, Suite? Like, is this a Christmas? No, Rat King's just Christmas a coffee? dude. Well, so and, and, all right, that that's neither here nor there. So the rat population explodes, and similar to the storyline from the Mirage Comics issues, where Baxter Stockman created the Mausers to destroy the rat population, mm -hmm. Donatello comes up with these robots to kill the rats that are rampaging through flooded New York City. But because he's Donatello, he does not make the same mistakes as Baxter Stockman and they're totally fine and everything goes swimmingly? No, as we see in this volume, uh, those robots have turned against oh, no. their masters. Oh, that is a disappointment. And <laughs> they have to go to war with those little droids as well. Oh my. But all that being said, the turtles are doing okay in this apocalypse. Actually, uh, as uh, the comic book couples counseling podcast, I'm a little concerned for content because they're getting along really well. They get along great in this issue. I there are I'll... moments, uh -huh. there are moments, but for the most part, they see each other eye to eye, but they've had a hundred years to work out their differences. Yeah, that's a lot of decades. Okay, well, Dr. H, pack up your stuff. 
Episode over. No, 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 no. It's just starting. So we're in the year 2094, and the main villain is Verminator X, and he is a NASA intern, a former NASA intern, Lisa. Is it weird for me to say that uh, he's a little hot? Like, oh. he's a very sexy Smoking. cougar kind of guy. And Chris Allen draws him perfectly. He's ripped. And his deal is he was a former friend who worked with Donatello to help build those robots and build the time slip machines. As Manx. But he then started to experiment on himself and those little robotic parts drew, drove him crazy. Mm. And now he's trying to destroy the turtles. And step one is hijacking the NASA Hubble telescope and zeroing in on an alien ship in far space that is coming our way. So that's the tension. And we go from that scene to a really violent nightmare that Raphael is suffering from. And I think that's where like Dr. Hubner could help because Raph is troubled. Yeah, the page turn yields Raphael covered in blood, scythes akimbo, standing atop the pale, bloodless corpses of his greatest enemies like a Frazetta painting. It is grotesque. And he is joyous. And then the skies open up and acid rain falls and melts his skin. And the scary thing is that he's loving it. And yeah, he's laughing maniacally like the Joker as his flesh melts off of his bones. And it's not like this is illustrated in a way that's like subtle. <laughs> like, yeah, no. no, it is like melting flesh. It is an R-rated page. Another important detail of this nightmare is that Raphael is not wearing his bandana thingy. No. So I interpret that as this is who he thinks he'd become if he left the Ninja Turtles and he went rogue. Mm. Like, without the grounding influence of his three brothers, he would become this kill raging monster. Well, if we look at the character of Raphael, we go back to the original iteration. If we go back to the Raphael micro series where he meets Casey Jones, the fear that Raphael had there was that his rage would get the better of him and he would become something like Casey Jones. Casey Jones is a dark mirror to Raphael and he doesn't want to be all rage, mm. right? Now, in his nightmare, he has killed everyone. All his villains are at his feet. He has won. He is victorious. And this is the full expression of his most badass attitude, anger triumphant. And it's terrifying. But also, like you said, he's laughing, right? He, he loves that he has allowed this anger to take over. And that's what propels him to wake up and feel a lot of shame for what he has just experienced. Lucky for him, as he throws himself out of that nightmare to wakefulness, he has Mezcal. And so he tells her this entire dream and with all of the shame of it and goes like, I must be messed up. I must be a messed up person to have a dream like this. And she consoles him and she says like, well, my grandmother said that dreams can mean many things. They can be glimpses of the future or they can just be a glimpse at our inner selves, free of pretense, unrestrained, and uninhibited. I'm going to give the full quote of how Raphael responds to that. He says, Now that's the kind of interpretation I like, Mezcal. None of this glimpse into the future mumbo-jumbo. I'll just forget the fact that technically, the dream was actually a nightmare, just like the future is. And Mezcal goes, Here we go again, you know Raph. Sometimes you're just way too negative. I think it's a little funky the way that he uses the word future there, because the future he's referring to is actually his present. It's the future for us, the readers and the writers and the turtles that we started Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures with. But for him, it's the present. Mm -hmm. And honestly, like, they seem to be doing great. Yes, the polar ice caps have melted, but they've got their own restaurant. He's married happily. Yeah. He has Turtle Co. with his brothers. Having lived from 2016 <laughs> to my dystopian present, like, I find where um, Raph is coming out of that dream and actually where Donatello is Super in the relatable. next scene, very relatable. Yeah. They both feel like they are in Armageddon. Yeah. But just like there isn't a sibling without the bad parts, there's not a present without the bad parts. Mm. Just think 
they're going to go back to Nazi Germany. <laughs> that was an Armageddon. Yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I don't want to try to spin that positive. No, no, since no. I went, I tripped right into the Holocaust. But so did the Ninja Turtles. So what can I say? But like, I think that Mezcal is suggesting, like, put away those. It's got to be Armageddon glasses, and put on some. Let's make the present better frames, and kind of reframe this narrative that. It's not Armageddon. We're still here and there's still something we can do. It reminds me of two things that we have discussed recently on the podcast. One, in our conversation with Brian Michael Bendis and Andre Arujo about Phenomena, mm -hmm. uh, they were talking about Star Wars. And the great thing about Star Wars is that they were having a good time while hell was busting loose mm. around them. Like there was a sense of joy to combat the oppressive fascism in Star Wars. Right. And it also reminds me of the first She-Hulk episode on Disney Plus, where Bruce Banner was telling Jennifer Walters about his time with Tony Stark in that bar in Mexico that they built together. It was a good time in a bad time. Right, right. You have to find joy when the world around you is a nightmare. But I don't begrudge Raphael or Donatello having their dark moments. I mean, things look bad. But you do have to, you know, find the joy as you are repairing your time slip generator that is being run on the brain of someone who's fixated on Nazi Germany. So Donatello doesn't know that this is Hitler's brain, but the reader does. Do we? Yes. So two trade paperbacks ago, Armagon, this mutant shark character, who is from this timeline, goes back to the OG Turtles timeline, and he is going through the wreckage of this underground nuclear facility that's run by Satan, by the way. Oh, okay. Mr. Null, who is the devil, <laughs> who does team up with the personification of death and the other four horsemen of the apocalypse. While he's in this wreckage, he uncovers a brain and he takes that brain with him to the future. And he uses that brain to power the time machine along with the radioactive material from the wreckage and the bones of the Roswell aliens. Okay, okay. <laughs> and he learns that it's Hitler's brain. So I see why Donatello is frustrated with all of the upgrades to his machine because they are complicated. So Raphael and Mezcal have Turtle Island, which is like a bar restaurant situation. Donatello is probably independently wealthy yes. because of his inventions. Definitely and independently he, wealthy. And he is still inventing, which is wonderful. What are the other turtles up to? Leonardo has a school of ninja. Yes. Uh, he's following in the footsteps of Master Splinter, teaching the young. Uh, and they are Nubuko, Miles, Carmen, and Bob. I love Bob. Bob's a mandrel. He's adorable. The others are just people. They're out on night patrol and they encounter a commando squad who are robbing a delivery boat. And in the fight, they capture those goons and rather than go to jail or wherever, they commit suicide. They have a capsule in the back of their teeth. They pop it and their face explodes. Yeah. Yes, it explodes. Yeah, it vaporizes. Kids comic, all ages. Barrel of laughs. Michelangelo is running an orphanage, Gabrielle's orphanage. He's also apparently quite the illustrator. And what's weird is we meet him as he is doing a drawing of what looks like the angel from the April O'Neil backup stories. But again, that's from 1999. Do you think that he has some kind of like time slip psychic rapport? I, that's what I'm going with. I think, yes, that that he's he's he can sense what April is going through in the past. Do you think he's still carrying a torch for April? And that's why he is unmarried? I wish, I really, really wish that April came up in some way in this storyline. But look line. at that image that's posted to his artboard. It looks like April. It, it does look like April. To me, it is April. So he's still got the hots for April. He's wearing a bowling shirt. He's taking care of these kids. He's having the time of his life. He is interrupted by Donatello, who dons the cyber samurai outfit and flies to the top floor and says, hey, we've got a situation. you got to come with us, Mikey while Leonardo goes to Turtle Island to collect Raphael. And here's where we get a little tension, not between the brothers, but between Raphael and Mezcal. 
So when we cut to Turtle Island, Mezcal is single-handedly throwing out two ruffians for <laughs> roughhousing in her establishment. And, and they high-five over it. Yeah, Raphael high-fives her and goes like, a woman after my own heart. But it's one of those high-fives from Tango and Cash where they high-five and then they clash. It's like a little hand hug yeah, and I love it. I love it. Um, but then Leonardo comes in and is like, hey, we've got a problem. And Mezcal, if you look at her expression, she is like not thrilled. no. no. And he's, and of course, Raphael's like, whatever you say, big bro, let me get my suit on. <laughs> and Mezcal has her arms crossed and she's like, okay, you go have your fun with your brothers. Don't worry about the place or anything. So like, to me, she's going like, hey, you're still going off to play with your boys when we've established a separate, like we have a business together and I feel deprioritized, I think is the subtext. Leonardo even says like, Raph, I hope I didn't get you in trouble with Mezcal. And he shrugs it off and like, no, she just likes giving me a hard time. But I think there's more to it than that. What's interesting, and again, you need to read the previous issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures. Raphael has a serious relationship throughout the entire run with another character named Ninjara. And when Raphael from the future goes back in time, he tells Raph, this relationship with Ninjara is not going to work and you're going to ruin everything. And you need to like get your stuff in order if you hope this romance will continue. What? Yes. What? <laughs> yes. So where does Mezcal come? Like, is he married to Mezcal when he goes back and like, yes. don't mess things up with your first yes. girlfriend? Yes. Ew. <laughs> it's, it's not a good look on Raph. It's not a good look. Oh my. Well, I'm glad he's waking up with nightmares. He deserves to have his skin melted. I mean, it explains that nightmare maybe even a little more. Yeah. Yeah. He is harboring a lot of guilt. But how does he deal with that guilt? he distracts himself by hanging out with his brothers fighting crime. And so they go looking for this commando squad or who was hiring the commando squad and they encounter another group of weirdos, these robots with corpses inside. Once the turtles get into samurai fighting mode, they fall right back into those sibling dynamics that we are very accustomed to. Totally. Leo, the oldest, starts giving orders. He has Donatello and Raph flank him. And then they, he sends Mikey to go do the, the personal relations grunt work. Go be the Good Samaritan. See how that rent -a cop is doing. She seems upset. <laughs> Big tear, like a giant cartoonish tear coming out of her eye. I would be crying too <laughs> if a uh, robot just killed my partner. And Donatello is the king of multitasking. He is. As he's doing the samurai fighting, he is also running a diagnostic test showing that these things are lifeless. And because they're lifeless, we can totally obliterate them. We can turn their lasers on them and blow out their chests. Or they're organic but lifeless, which I think is a key distinction. Yeah, they're soulless, so we can just chop them up, no problem. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, Donatello's like, whatever they are, they're not alive. And Raphael goes, that's good, considering how we probably cavorked the lot of them. <laughs> which I'm like, what a 90s reference, Dr. Kevorkian. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that. <laughs> oh yeah. But, like, if, oh. we think, if we think of, like, the um, character arc for Raph, where he fears being a killer at the beginning with his nightmare. Now he is relieved that he has the opportunity to kill these animated but lifeless beings. And this will come up again at the end of this arc. So let's put a pin yeah. in that emotional state for Raph. Then we get this like comparatively minor, but I still want to like point at it, little static between brothers. I think that Donatello is feeling a little like big in his britches after being the individual who solved the like, these are zombie robots problem. Mm. And he goes, Mike, find out what that ship is transporting. And if you would, meanwhile, and Mikey replies to Donatello's order, orders, orders, orders. Mm. So Mikey likes getting orders from Leonardo. But not Donatello. But he doesn't want to get orders from anyone else. Mm, that's like, interesting. Because I do think that he is hyper aware of his status of being the lowest turtle. So I think that anyone other than Leonardo giving him direct orders kind of gets under his shell a little bit. But I think 
Dr. H, Dr. Hubner, would appreciate how Donatello doesn't take Mikey's bait. Mm. There was an opportunity there to continue a fight, and Donatello either doesn't notice or he chooses not to notice. I think he is following rule number two, ignore bad behaviors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, we do finally learn at the conclusion of this little fight that Verminator X is indeed behind these two criminal organizations. And because they can't get the job done, he's got to do it himself. And so the turtles go out on patrol separately and he finds Mikey on his own and he attacks and he brutalizes Mikey. Raph finds Mikey's body hanging by a flagpole and brings him back to his brothers, and it looks like Mikey is dead. Meanwhile, Adolf Hitler's brain has turned on the time machine, and he's gone back to his Third Reich. And oh, oh, the alien from space from the beginning of the arc. His name is Craniac, and he has found Verminator X, and they have partnered into some kind of scheme? Yeah, yeah. We've got a lot of weird balls in the air, and it is only <laughs> going to get weirder. Yeah, real quick. So Dreamland Part 3 opens with Michelangelo on a ventilator, and, like, we almost lost him. It was, like, literally minutes. And Mezcal actually is the one who's the most worried. And she goes, like, are we doing the right thing? Should we actually take him to a hospital? And Donatello is, like... Our physiology is so weird. There is no one more equipped to take care of my brother than me, which is why I need to be here. In fact, I think that all of us should stay here. And Leonardo is like, don't worry about it. I'm going to leave my three to four students, four <laughs> students. Bob. Here. What about Bob? Bob. Leave my four students here to watch over his nigh lifeless body while we go take care of whatever is happening in Nazi Germany. <laughs> and Donatello is like, okay, whatever you say. Like, this is the only time where Donatello kind of pushes back on Leonardo and he changes his mind more or less immediately. I think it's a huge leap of faith for him to accept Leonardo's students as family. And he knows that he's leaving Michelangelo with family, which is what he really wants. And we get another scene where Mezcal is forced to stay behind while Raph goes with his brothers to deal with serious business. In this case, Adolf Hitler's brain. And Raphael gives her a really cute ruffle of the dreads. And he's like, bye, I guess we're out of here. And she gives him this really sweet peck on the cheek. And she says, just watch yourself, Romeo. I'm not ready to be a widow just yet. I think that this is a huge change from the last time she saw him leave with Leonardo. And, and she's why like, do you think that is? I think it's because now that she sees the life and death stakes because of Michelangelo on the hospital bed on a ventilator. And she understands that the Ninja Turtles cannot spare Raphael. If any one of them is not there, somebody gets hurt. And when they go back in time, they're going to be missing Mike. They're going to be down a brother. And what they're doing is really important. I would have loved to see between the panels when they really actually filled her in on what they're up to with the whole like <laughs> weird brain going back in time thing. That's actually one of the delights and frustrations of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures is that a lot does happen between the panels. Fights get resolved between the panels. People get injured between the panels. Whole worlds are discussed between the panels. Especially with these last two issues of this storyline, like there are so many moving parts between the Verminator X Craniac yeah. team up and the we have to kill Hitler's brain issue. Like, so some of these just things just fall through the cracks. So before we go back to Hitler's Germany, that's where we learn the whole plot of Craniac and Verminator X. Craniac fills Verminator X in on his scheme. And what his scheme is, is he's traveled to Earth to harvest human brains, but not all human brains, just the brains with the most interesting memories. 
brains like Adolf Hitler's brain. And perhaps the Ninja Turtle's and, brains. And the Ninja Turtle's brains. So he can sell those memories to other sentient life forms off world. Say what you will about cyber samurai mutant Ninja Turtles adventures, but a villain who invades Earth to steal that which is most precious to us, our memories, is brilliant. It is like the most heinous act. Yeah, well, speaking of heinous acts, we are now at the point where we are going to discuss the page in this comic, which is easily the most famous page in all of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles adventures. I think most people see this page before they ever read this book. That's certainly the case for me. And it's the page where a one-eyed Raphael from the future clocks Adolf Hitler in the face. And it's a wildly strange image, but not as wildly and strange as the setup. So we already have this brain going back in time. Hitler's brain going back in time. I don't even know why he's going back in time. Why I, is he going back in time, Lisa? I think he's like homesick. He's been thinking about, you know, his golden years and... All brains kind of want to be with their bods, I think. And I think he's just nostalgic. Yes, nostalgic. Like, we have to fill in the gaps, right? Because the motivation is not actually explained. But what's weird is he's walking around a bombed out Berlin and he's in this robot body with four arms and uh, attached to a fishbowl that has a swastika painted on it. So he's established himself already back in time. And he is hanging out with the other Hitler who is just there with some SS officers. Who recognize his brain immediately. Like everybody, nobody's like, what's this brain doing here? Everybody's like, hey, here's you and here's your brain. So as someone who was highly anticipating this moment, reading this entire comic, just waiting for it to happen, when it does happen, it happens so quickly. The turtles arrive right on the heels of the Hitler brain, but not right on the heels, because again, the Hitler brain has established himself back in time. We know, okay, so we notice, or Dawn notices, that the brain is missing before Raph brings Mikey back. OK, and then Donatello sets the coordinates, but we don't know what coordinates the brain set for. So that brain could have been there for years. And I think he was. He must have been. And it seems to me that Hitler is actually answering to Hitler's yes. brain. Yes, it feels like Hitler's brain is the new boss of the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler is like second in command. Which makes sense because Hitler's brain knows that they lost the war. So Hitler's brain is doing what Raph did. It's going back to Ninjara and going like, we can do it all different. And failing just like Raph did, right? So the turtles show up. There's a firefight between the Nazis and the turtles, but also Berlin is being bombed by the allies. That's right. And the brain on its stilts is hit with an explosion and goes pop. So of course Hitler is like, nine, my beautiful brain, I gotta get it back to Mengele. And uh, Raphael stands over him then and says, yo Adolf, this small gesture is for the millions, perv. The millions. And that's when you get that really rad chalk yeah. of Raphael punching Hitler right in the kisser. I think we need to bring back perv when talking about monsters like Adolf Hitler, right? Because he is perverted. Like, perv was 90s slang. It was. But Hitler was a perv. He was the king of pervs. And then Raphael just picks up his brain and tucks it in his coat like a football. And they have to get back to the time slip. That's right, because of course Donnie drops the remote. And who has the remote? They didn't, like chain up Adolf Hitler after Raph punched him out. <laughs> they just left him there. So somehow Hitler gets ahead of them, blocks them from the time slip. But this is the first time where Hitler kind of soaks in the scene and he sees these three turtle creatures and he goes, oh my God, these are demons. And Leonardo leans in on that. Yeah, he's like, welcome to hell. And with gun raised, Adolf is like, well, you're not taking my soul. And Leonardo's like, we're not here for your soul. We're here for your brain. So Adolf turns the gun on himself and is like, well, you're not taking this, blammo. This page reads with the same impact as the one where Raphael clocks Hitler. You know, Leo is manipulating this monster to his death. And when he says like, no, we came for your brain, he's saying that 
as he is stepping backward into the time slip. So he doesn't hang around to watch Hitler kill himself, but he knows that he has done it already. He has pulled the trigger on Adolf Hitler. What I think is slightly different between Raph's moment and Leo in this moment is that Raph gave himself like an emotional release. He was angry as he should be. And Leo doesn't. And yeah, like for what Raph is doing is kind of personal where what Leo is doing is actually a solution. And yet this is not the climax of this arc. They have, still have like so much stuff to do. <laughs> this is like the sweeps weeks mid season climax. We still got to get back to Verminator X and Craniac, the real villains of dreamland who have managed to entirely bind up Leonardo's <laughs> students. Yeah, they were not good to their word in protecting Michelangelo, but it turns out Michelangelo didn't really need that protection anyway. As the Ninja Turtles land, Verminator X and Craniac are like backing into Craniac's ship and like waving like, bye guys, Audi 5000. And by the way, there <laughs> is right. an Armageddon style asteroid plummeting towards Earth. You're all doomed. So they take off in the ship but clinging to the ship is the just barely out of a coma Michelangelo. Like, it's okay, dudes. I got this. And that's how the issue ends. Dreamland issue four is such a weird issue, possibly even a weirder issue than the last one. Impossible. But it's also a really great action issue. And I think that we do see some character development specifically in the dynamics in which they operate under pressure. I think that Mikey comes out of this coma revitalized. And he's the one who's like, hey guys, let's rock and roll. We gotta get him. And we see Mezcal take up arms. We see all of Leonardo's students whom he considers his children take up arms. To me, this is kind of a, like a, a family reunion. It's a leveling up. It is. And that moment where Mikey goes, let's rock and roll, it's a splash page. It's actually like, okay, so we get this great page where it's all these thin vertical panels of the turtles tooling up, you know, grabbing their size, their ninja, t ninja stars, their nunchucks. The students also pack in heat. They got guns, laser guns. And then you turn the page from those vertical panels to this massive splash page. And that's when Mikey's like, let's rock and roll. And that page where we see the full might of the cyber samurai ninja turtles, that's a comic. That's a spinoff. We want more of this. And yet we're at the end of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures. This is the last story of these turtles. That makes me so angry. Right? Right? Aren't you in like aren't you in love with them already? Absolutely. Especially considering that the brothers are tighter than ever and they are ready to fold all of these other new members to the team. The only other person speaking in that splash page is Mezcal, and she's like, yeah, let's do this. And you think at the beginning of this volume, she was like, I'm really happy being a restaurateur. Yeah, I feel like the other members outside of the Four Brothers complete the Four Brothers. Absolutely. And we've seen behavior that would have triggered the turtles yes. in the past. They're not taking the bait like they once did. Leonardo is still the leader, but he gives the brothers more autonomy than he's ever given. All he says is two paths, as above, so below, the clasp of the Tao. Oh, yeah. Leonardo and Donatello are wearing their samurai suits because they're going to fly, and Mikey and Raphael are taking the rest of the team underwater because Craniac and Verminator X went into a spaceship just to immediately dive down to an underwater layer. Right, well, that's where their lab is, right? That's where they're stockpiling all those brains and their memories, their delicious, delicious memories. And all of their zombie army, <laughs> which is what Raphael and Mikey end up facing. <laughs> and it is like a Dawn of the Dead, George Romero zombie army. 
and just when you think this comic can't get any more violent, they are hacking and slashing their way through these bodies, these undead, goopy, droopy bodies. They are cutting off heads. But it's not really violence if they're already dead, right? That's definitely Raphael's attitude. Well, like, that's what this comic does over and over again. It has to establish that the villain, the opponent that they are facing, they're not really alive. Just like those corpses inside those robots, they don't feel pain. They don't have souls. They're just the undead. So let's chop these dudes' heads off. But this gives Leonardo's students an opportunity to see Raphael and Mikey in a whole new light. Because initially, when they're going in to this lair, Nabucco and Miles are like, that's not the way Leonardo would do <laughs> things. And it really actually gets Raphael and Mikey's hackles up. It makes them feel vulnerable and sensitive. And through their defeat of the zombie army, the students gain a new respect for the strength of these younger brothers. I do think, though, like that vulnerability, if this was the younger versions from 110 years ago, they would be more than defensive. They would allow the frustration to get in the way of their mission. You would have had a fight scene there between the brothers. Dude. Or at least between the brothers and the students. In our excitement to get to the zombies... I feel like we skipped over a major moment for Mikey. So right after Leonardo gives the command to split the team, Mikey and Raphael together, Mikey is the one who says, I'll lead, and Raphael lets it happen. Yeah. That's enormous. Could that count as ignoring with a twist from Raphael's point of view, from Dr. Hubner? Absolutely. It's a huge distraction to just go along with it. But I think that this is even one step further than ignoring with a twist because he's agreeing and then behaving accordingly. Little brother, you want to be the leader? I'm ready to see how this goes. It is a balls to the wall, stakes high, yes and, I believe in you baby brother. The Michelangelo that we see here in this issue who has leveled up and the guy who says, let's rock and roll. The guy who takes care of Gabrielle's orphanage, right? The one who has a little more responsibility than we've ever seen him before. When you think about this Michelangelo and you look at where Michelangelo em eventually ends up in the IDW universe, even though it's probably different timelines, it's kind of like you can see and I don't want to spoil this one comic, but you can see how the Michelangelo of the IDW universe becomes that Michelangelo looking at this Michelangelo in Team NT Adventures. Do you, do you know what I'm saying here? I know 100% what you're saying. And like, as a person who is a member of a four, I have two brothers and one sister. To play the role that you play all of the time is a passive thing to do, no matter what your role is. And it's always great to see that person level up, step out of their role and achieve a new role. It is terrifying saying, hey, I can do different, I can do more. And the idea of another sibling giving you the grace and the space to do that is tremendous. And that sibling being Raphael? Yes, oh. the most dis like the most rebellious, the most emotionally shut down of the brothers. The most solo of the brothers. Mm. But we can't ignore what's happening with Donatello and Leonardo. <laughs> uh, they are underwater and they are being attacked by all those brains. Why are the brains who have been kidnapped out of their bodies, why are the brains now attacking Leonardo and Donatello? I think that brains want to be in a body. I don't think they're comfortable <laughs> be, be, being like on the loose. I think they're like, I want to be all up in those guts. <laughs> <laughs> well, they nearly drag Leonardo to the bottom of the sea. And that's the cliffhanger of that issue. But when we pick back up in the next issue, more zombie fighting, more zombie fighting, heads getting cut off, heads getting cut off. Then Donatello, using his gauntlet pulsars, blasts the brains off of Leonardo's armor, freeing his intake valve so he can swim away to safety. Only after giving a really long and technical description of exactly what he's doing, 
Just hold still while I power up my gauntlet pulsars enough concussive force to tear through blah, 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 blah. And Leonardo, as he, <laughs> the breath of life goes back into him. But look he, at that panel. As the gauntlet pulsars shoot into his chest, like, he's like, yes. He looks like that gif of the woman with all the hot dogs splashing on oh, her yeah. face. <laughs> he's loving taking in that blast. He's saying, I never thought I'd be so happy to hear such Geek talk, Donnie. Like, those words of affirmation. Just go, Like, Donnie has taken the lead role in a lot of different places within this arc. And we know how Mikey took it. Mikey was like, ugh, it feels weird getting orders from Donatello. But here... Leonardo is submitting to him being the leader. Of course, it took... Yes. It, it submitting took, to that blast, Lisa. <laughs> it took all of his holes being plugged with brain stems <laughs> and um, his life force kind of being drained out of him for him to finally um, be saved. Man, this comic is making me loopy. Well, it's not done because Raphael steps out of his role as the emotions forward, punch Adolf Hitler first, ask questions later guy. And he Which goes, we should all be. Yeah, we should, we should all punch be. Adolf Hitler first, ask questions later. <laughs> always punch the Nazi. He's now going like, I've done, I've done enough punching for a lifetime. These zombies are not quitting. I have to think outside of my role, think a little bit more like Donatello, and go like, hey, these zombies run on electricity. So all I gotta do is take Donatello's bow staff, both literally and figuratively, and I'm going to, um, I, I don't understand the science. He, he hits a switch on the bow staff and electricity is sucked out of the zombies into the staff. Yes, as he's doing that, he says, so, don't take no master's degree to figure this one out. <laughs> so I think that he is now comparing himself to Donatello and going like, you know what? I've actually probably learned a lot from this guy. And I I can think differently and do differently. And it's Raphael's logical brain that saves Leonardo's students and Mezcal. Granted, he does a lot of swearing as he's doing it, and he kind of scandalizes Miles. He's like, oh, I don't know if Leonardo would have sweared that he, much. He takes the electricity from the bow staff, so he collects the zombie energy into the bow staff, he redirects it to the wall, he blasts the wall, and that creates an entrance for Leonardo and Donatello to join the team again. I don't think Raphael necessarily knew that Donatello and Leonardo were on the other side of that wall. No, it's a lucky shot. I don't want to take it away from him or anything. I mean, like, but this is a historical Teenage okay. Mutant Ninja Turtles document. Okay. Uh, also on the other side of that wall were Craniac and Verminator X. Craniac is at the end of his patience, and he's like, <laughs> screw it. These Ninja Turtles are getting on my nerves. I'm taking their brains. But Verminator X is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not our agreement. We agreed to only take brains from people who were already dead. So, okay, the brains are coming from those zombies from earlier in the issue. Right. So were they going to graveyards and animating the zombies after having taken out their brains? That's right, because we haven't even used this word once and it's used like 50,000 times in this comic. Verminator X specialty is oh, thanotics. Thanotics, yes. Which is the marriage of dead tissue and robotics. Yeah, okay, okay. So taking the living brains of the turtles is a bridge too far for Verminator X. Because he, he's a man of principles yeah, he, as well as sexiness. He turns on Craniac. Craniac's like, fine, forget this. There's an asteroid coming. I'm out of here. Thanks for the memories. And he jettisons off world. And then Raphael turns on Verminator X and Raphael murders Verminator X. Technically, it was a standoff. <laughs> and Verminator X had a gun on him. Yeah. And Raphael is like, I have this hot coyote over here. <laughs> there is an asteroid plummeting towards Earth. And 
Time is precious. It comes down to a dare, Lisa. Verminator X says, I dare you to shoot me. And Raphael says, I dare you. And then Raphael pulls the trigger first. And it's a two-page splash, a big old blam. And Verminator X goes down. And Leonardo is really hurt by this. He's surprised. And, well, he's hurt because he goes, like, Master Splinter taught us to never... Take life. Yeah. Now, one thing, another thing we haven't mentioned. He this says in comic. anger. He says in anger, like you shot him, and Raphael's response is very cold. He's like, "Yes, I did." I think what really hurts Leonardo is that we haven't mentioned this yet, but Leonardo's school wears a splinter mon. Their image is a rat's face in this kind of like flower shape, and in this final battle. Everyone in that splash we talked about earlier is wearing that mon. And I think that Leonardo sees Raphael shooting someone in the face with a gun as kind of a thumb in the nose. A betrayal. Yeah. It is a betrayal. Master Splinter would be not happy with Raphael. It's a betrayal of his memory. And then Raphael doubles down and says, like, the world isn't like what it was when Master Splinter was alive. It's much harsher, and we all know that. And this goes back to the very beginning of the arc after the nightmare when Raphael wakes up and he calls the present that he is living in, the future that he is living in, a nightmare. And he can't imagine a better place. Because he sees those same enemies come back again and again and again, and they don't stop creating all of this havoc. And he says like, you know, like if I didn't kill Verminator X today, he would come back tomorrow if this asteroid doesn't kill me first. And that's where Raphael is let off the hook because he does have his buddy, Donatello, his brother, the smart one. He is able to resurrect Verminator X using his skills and transforms him back into Manx. He deprograms the villainous side of Verminator X, and the two of them, Manx and Donatello, find a way to go out into space and destroy that asteroid and save the planet Earth. Do you honestly believe that after Raphael does that, Donatello's like, no, I got this. I'm going to cure Verminator X. Raphael, you can stay a Ninja Turtle? Because to me, I think for Leonardo... And Raphael, I feel like this is potentially an end of their relationship. I think that their differing opinions of the level of violence they're willing to go to has been the elephant in the room this entire time. And I think that Raphael, rather than resolve this or go back on what he did. I think that he really believed in shooting Verminator X in this moment. And I think that he could have very well put his arm around Mezcal that day and never looked back. Well, I mean, that's how this comic ends, or at least that's how Raphael's story ends in this comic. He does put his arm around Mezcal and they walk out through the hole in the wall, never to be seen again. So there is an implication that there is a breaking point with these brothers. So that kind of negates everything we were just saying a few minutes earlier about how they are operating at the height of their powers. They've resolved all their issues. So now maybe that's not true at all. Maybe it's still the same old issues repeating themselves. I think that they were operating at the height of their powers, but that still didn't get to the heart of their differing principles. Yeah, and... You know, we don't know what happens after this. We have a Schrodinger's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle team. Yes. So the next arc of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures goes back to the OG Turtles, back to our present time or the 90s time and tells the the story about how Ninjara and Raphael break up. And we get like a pre-teen Age Mutant Ninja Turtle story about how the Turtles got their weapons, but we never return to the future timeline. There was a story planned, but Archie nixed it, and Chris Allen and Dean Clarion were never able to complete that story. 
But back in 2009, for the 25th anniversary of the Turtles, Mirage was going to give them the chance to do it. Ooh. But then Viacom bought Mirage Studios and the Turtles. No. And that was next. It was going to be called The Forever War. They did do like a Kickstarter semi or quasi official release of the first issue of that story. But I cannot get my hands on it. I don't see any images from it. It seems pretty expensive to acquire, but I am on the hunt. But they did never actually finish the story of the Cyber Samurai Ninja Turtles. I wonder if we could treat this kind of like Usagi, Ojimbo, and Senso, mm. where we are at the extremity of possibility with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and if we take them as we know them and we put this in, in this other extreme circumstance, this is canon of how this would happen. Yeah, I like that. The, the, the What makes this different than Senso is Senso feels like the end of Usagi Ojimbo. Like, that mm -hmm. is a possible end. I don't like the idea of this being a possible end for the Ninja Turtles. Well, there's clearly more. Yeah, there's yeah. There's clearly more. Yeah, yeah. Now... The next Ninja Turtles comic we talk about, I think that's more like the Senso of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But mm. again, I don't want to spoil that. I don't want to jump ahead in time just yet because we do need to do a wrap up and we need to do an investigation of how we are feeling about these four brothers in relation to each other, in relation to us, in relation to Dr. Hubner. Do you mind if I start? I don't. So like where I'm ending this particular run with this unsettled feeling between Leonardo and Raphael is kind of where I find myself kind of feeling limited by what Dr. Hubner is offering in her book. Like I understand that what she's writing is geared towards children and yes. it's really moving towards like, Hey, we all have to live under a roof together and <laughs> mom just wants to like drink her wine and have a <laughs> night and can we please stop the bickering? But like, you know, I find myself wanting to fold a lot of these tactics into the way I interact with my family members in Putting order on your your friend glasses ignoring with a twist yeah like really going peace forward like hey i would love to come out of this family gathering with no one feeling upset but then these principles get in the way these big principles like to me i think that like i don't have any principle differences with my siblings that are so enormous. I, I don't think that any of them are like ready to shoot Verminator X in the face <laughs> while I still have reservations. Like it's nothing that enormous, but it is things that create these kind of conversational vacuums where I feel like I can't get any closer to them. And I do find myself kind of clinging to my mezcal and going like, <laughs> am I mezcal? Yeah, you're mezcal. Nice. You're a super hot coyote. Oh yeah. And um, we have our own venture together, <laughs> and it's very easy for me to put a boundary up with these family members that I've grown up with, and are this like invaluable resource of perspective on my life, and go like, it's just easier for me to be with my spouse where I feel like I do want to get to this place where I can, where I feel like I can tell my siblings anything and everything. And like, and that's where I really feel like I need guidance with my, with my siblings. Well, the limitations of Dr. Hubner's book is that it is a children's book mm -hmm. and it is a list of devices that you can use with your brothers and sisters when they are also children. But imagine my frustration where like the Ninja Turtles can't even really make it work fully where they can be totally at peace 
totally have their own lives, but still be able to come together on the reg yeah. to do some vigilante samurai justice. And yet still they have something that can explode their well, relationship. There is certainly with Leonardo and Raphael, there is a big principal moment in this storyline that cannot be solved with a simple tool. Maybe it goes back to the Esther Perel idea of like to be in a relationship, your principles do not have to be in unison. You know what I mean? I go out on the street and live my life. I have clients and friends and people I love very dearly that have differing principles, but I don't find that as incendiary because they're not my family. Yeah, but principles are tricky, right? Mm. So there are times when you cannot uh, ignore your principle. Right, and, of course. And, and it's a privilege to be able to communicate with somebody who has differing principles than your own that's it so like the problem is not that our the venn diagram of our principles is not a circle the problem is that i let it create distance and it makes me scared yeah it makes me scared to share with my family because i know that they'll get upset too it's like it's like um uh it's just a powder keg all around sometimes i hear you i really do But we also have to realize that the reason we like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or at least one of the big reasons we like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, are the conflicts, you know, are the tensions between the brothers. And we have to also see, like, the tensions and the conflicts in our family make us unique and make us who we are. Now, of course, again... (laughs) Like, let's all hope we don't have a big principal moment like Leonardo and Raphael do here. But that's what fiction does, right? It goes to the extremity and says, hey, if these two brothers can have this big principal moment, <laughs> like killing Verminator X and work beyond it, maybe you can work with your smaller principled issues. Mm. And maybe not. But maybe. For me, what... Reading the Ninja Turtles does is remind me how important and rewarding a sibling relationship can be and that it's worth the effort. Yeah, it looks fragile, though. It is fragile. And and like you as the Mezcal, I don't know if she has siblings. Doesn't seem like it. I, I, I like to think that Mezcal's an only child like myself. <laughs> so she's like looking at their relationship with all of the awe and wonder as an alien from another planet, maybe an entirely other species, and going like, you know, like maybe you do just kind of want to hang out at the bar and watch me kick out ruffians. Yeah, uh, yeah. So for me, uh, the jury's still out with Dr. Hubner. I always like a list of tiny little activities that you can use to help your way through a tense moment. But these do feel very simplistic. But again, they're like for children. So it they're, makes sense. They're a great first step. And if they work eight out of ten times or even three out of ten times. Success. They're worth giving a go. What I really want to know, Lisa, is are you compelled now to explore more of this era of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Will you go back and read some Archie TMNT books? Honestly, don't come at me, but I enjoyed these more than those original Mirage books. Sure. Because I feel like the characters are more defined. I feel like the Ninja Turtles have kind of found their individual voices and as like extreme and wild these storylines are, it's nice to see them kind of be themselves. Yeah, and that wildness, that WTF nature of these comics, like this is an all ages comic mm-hmm. so they're chopping off all these heads, like that's also a delight, right? It's a delight and the fact that no matter where you take Mikey, he's Mikey. No matter where you take Raphael, he's Raphael. I still think that they can grow and be themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think this story in particular epitomizes that. I was kind of shocked when we did, like, as we were talking about this comic a little bit more 
issue by issue to go like, oh man, these characters did grow and change perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to continue working my way through this series using the Comixology Unlimited app. They are all on there. You need to get on them too. Now that they know what Brad Gullickson is doing in the near future, let's get into what comic book couples counseling is doing in the near future because it's kind of making my head spin. December is going to be the most stacked month of comic book couples counseling that we've had all year. Can we do it? I hope so. First, we're talking That Texas Blood with Chris Condon and Jacob Phillips. We've already had that conversation. It is awesome. Then we have Elisa Quitney on talking guilt. And I love where that conversation goes. Guilt is a comic that you need to read if you're putting together the best comics of 2022. If you yes. have not read Guilt from Ahoy Comics, you need to do so. Also... Elise is just super rad, and we talk about Sandman because she was an assistant editor for Sandman, and we talk about the effable nature of Morpheus, and you're going to have to guess which effable I'm talking about. <laughs> then we conclude our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series with IDW's The Last Ronin. Yes, and this is the book that I feel has the most in common with Usagi Yojimbo's Senso. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's an interesting place to leave our conversation on the sibling dynamics with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, considering that three of the brothers are dead in this timeline. It's going to be a really challenging talk, but I'm looking forward to it. Then we have our end of the year best comics of 2022 spectacular featuring a bevy of celebrity guests. And they've already turned in their clips Not talking about their first comics, and they are great selections. Yeah, I love this episode, these episodes. It's always a two-parter. Very excited to put this out there. And then, yeah, it's 2023, baby. Three weeks of December left and five episodes to uh -huh. release. Yeah. I think we're going to need Donatello's time slip machine. Whose brain are we going to use? Not Hitler's. <laughs> Not Hitler's. <laughs> I was weirdly, the first name that popped into my head was Julie Andrews. Oh, okay. <laughs> Where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? Uh, you can find me on all social medias at Mouthdork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show poster, send them to Karen Charm at Karen underscore X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, Google, and Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to get exclusive, mm. you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. If you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at cbccpodcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to do an act of service, why not write a review of the show while you're there? We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. Doopie doopie. Bum, bum, ba -da, bum, bum, ba -da, ba. Okay, I liked, I like, I, if I get to reset it, then I should get to do the snap. No, my snap. Ha, ha, ha.